Good morning, family, on this beautiful Sunday morning, the second one in November 2021. Can you believe we're already on the 14th of November 2021? Just a, a few weeks to Christmas. This year has absolutely flown by. Before we get started and, and go to that, one of my favorite things, God's Word, let's, uh, let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for the privilege that we have of sharing together today in your Word, Lord. Sharing together, Lord, as we, as we come together, no matter where we, we may be um, positioned around the world, as we, as we uh, Lord, um, worship in this service. So, Father, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the technology which makes all this possible. But most important, Lord, we thank you for your great love and mercy in our lives. We ask, Father, that you would have your way in this service, that you would talk to us, Lord, that you would work in our hearts and lives today, that you would change us, Lord, because of this time that we spend together with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, what a beautiful, beautiful day it is today. On the 8th of March last year, I preached a sermon entitled Tipping Point. The sermon had three points, a good Nazarene sermon, three points, right? The first point was Jesus demands radical change of thought, of heart, and of life. The second point was that Jesus creates a radical tipping point in our lives. And the third point was that Jesus demands that we examine ourselves. And we explored the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus and, and, and that, that greatest tipping point that the world has ever seen since the Garden of Eden when Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Back in March last year, we had absolutely no idea um, of the changes that were to come. No idea that our lives would be so affected, our relationships with one another so altered by lockdown and all the social distancing rules and, and regulations that have been imposed on the world. Tipping points. That's something we've spoken about over the past 20 months. How different the world seems now to what it was in March last year. How it's affected us, God's children. Even coming to church is different. And yet when it comes to what really counts, our relationship with God, nothing has changed. Jesus still demands radical change of thought and heart and life. And last week we celebrated that change as we, as we watched a shot and Venita being baptized, buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live new life. Our old lives traded in for new life in Christ. The radical tipping point that Jesus created in our lives when, when we accepted that he gave his life for ours. And we were born into God's kingdom as we, we confessed with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. And believed in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. This is still the defining point of our lives. It brought us into relationship with God our creator. As we were adopted right into his own family. Sons and daughters of the king. And Jesus still demands that we examine ourselves, that, that we are consciously aware of the way that we are living our lives. He said to Nicodemus, this is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. What about us? Are we interested in pleasing God? Is that our life's goal? Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates Godlight and won't come near it, fearing painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and, and reality welcomes Godlight so that work can be seen for the God work that it is. Some interesting pictures painted right here by Eugene Peterson. Those who make a practice of doing evil. This is not the occasional sin that trips you up here and there. This is the deliberate practice of sin. It's the practice of behaviors that remove us from God's presence. See, God 
cannot be where there is sin. Addiction to denial and illusion paints the picture of the lies that are spoken in excuse for our bad behavior, which when spoken so often form the basis of what we believe about ourselves and our situations. And if we say it often enough, it must be true, right? You see, light exposes the things done in darkness. And those lies, they will not stand the test of time. The day will come when that fear of painful exposure will become the very, very painful reality. Jesus said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On Friday morning at our men's meeting, we were talking about the virtual reality that has been created by social media and the big tech giants. They want us to believe that meeting one another on a screen or through a virtual reality headset is as good and perhaps better given the challenges that we face because of the pandemic than meeting physically. We'll be able to see each other, shake hands with each other, hug and meet in a virtual space all without leaving the comfort of our own lounge. They paint a wonderful picture of the benefits of this technology, even for the church. Able to hold virtual meetings in places where you cannot mention the name of Jesus. Hmm. But what about the obvious problems that it will bring? The truth is that this kind of relationship experienced through social media is a sanitized relationship. Yes, you heard me. A sanitized relationship. One in which you only see the mask presented. Not the real character of the person that you're connected to. This thing that poses as truth and life and reality in the world in which we live. It's not the truth, the life. And the reality of God's kingdom. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Today let's make use of this opportunity to really examine ourselves. Opposition to Jesus was fierce as he walked the streets of Jerusalem. As we read through John's gospel, we see him constantly at loggerheads with the religious leaders of the day. In chapter 7, we see them sending out the temple guards to arrest him. But they return empty-handed, saying, no one ever spoke the way that this man does. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where, where all the, the people gathered around him and he, and he sat down to teach. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and, and, and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? How interesting it, it is that these religious leaders had absolutely no regard for the well-being of this woman whom they shamed by parading her publicly in the temple courts. You know, it takes two to have an adulterous affair. Where was the man involved? This was never about the case they presented so vocally and loudly to Jesus. They were blatantly using her to try and trap him. They were so blinded by their anger for Jesus and their, and their need to protect themselves and their religious traditions that they were willing to use anyone they could at whatever cost to have him silenced. And we all know how this went. Jesus bent down and, and, he, and he started writing in the sand. But those leaders, they continued to pressure him. They wanted an answer. Finally, he straightened up. All right, he said, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Checkmate. As, as what he had just said slowly sank in. The crowds surrounding them began to disperse. The older ones, the first to leave, until he was finally alone with her. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. 
then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Remember, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Go now and leave your life of sin. Friends, this is the offer that you and I receive from Jesus. This is exactly what he says to you and me. This was just the first of many or a number of confrontations in the temple that day. And why am I telling you this? Because, friends, what we believe determines the way we behave. Let me say that again. What we believe determines the way we behave. Just ask those Pharisees. And family, here we are, the church, 2,000 years later, and it's easy for us to sit here in judgment on these religious leaders. But, but I wonder where we would have found ourselves. On, on which side of the divide would we have been toy-toying if we had been in the temple on that day? Are we any different to them? So many have so much to say about Jesus, yet they heap such criticism and condemnation on those around them. Others have plenty to say about how good they are, but their actions never quite meet up with their words. In other words, the Jesus we hear spoken about is most definitely not the Jesus we see in them. It was Mahatma Gandhi who said, I like your Christ. I do not like you Christians. You Christians are so unlike your Christ. Ellen sent me this little um, clip a week ago. It came, uh, it came in on our Wednesday night Bible study meeting too as we, as we discussed um, freedom in Christ and what it means. Many people rejected Jesus because of bad experiences with religious people. But here's the thing. Jesus had bad experiences with religious people too. In fact, they killed him. People will let you down. Jesus won't. <laughs> Is this your experience too? Have you been let down by people? Have you had bad experiences with religious people? The Apostle Paul had an answer for this problem. He said, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Friend, who do you serve today? Who do you serve? What is it that we really, really believe, family? Has it worked out into our behavior? You see, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John said, in him was life and that life was the light of mankind. He was there when light was spoken in the very beginning. Let there be. And it was. He was the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord Most High. And ultimately John said of heaven, I did not see the temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Hmm. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the second time Jesus used that I am statement. Back in Capernaum on the day after he fed 5,000 and, and walked on water, Jesus said to the crowd, 
I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. What's he saying? Remember when God spoke to Moses, telling him to go back to Egypt and rescue his people? Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am. And the religious leaders clamored out in challenge. Where is your father? And Jesus answered, you do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. What an indictment on those who oppose him. These are the very leaders who are to lead the people into the father's presence. Just a few months later, Jesus makes another I am statement when he says to Thomas, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. What a statement. The word was with God and the word was God. Jesus says, you have seen me, Thomas. You know me. You know the Father too. Seeing is not believing. Why? Because we interpret what we see in light of what we believe. Put another way, we see life through the lens of our belief. And Jesus was right when he said to these men, you do not know me or my father. They knew a lot about the father. They had studied the father. They knew a lot about him. They had witnessed the signs and wonders that followed Jesus. They had heard him teach. And yet they were caught up in their old belief system, working out their religion, law upon law, in the belief that it would somehow lead them to their Messiah. But it was their own King David who wrote, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. What is your desire this morning, church? What is your desire? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these Two commandments. And now I'm left wondering if Gandhi were to come into church this morning, if he were to walk into Cornerstone this morning, would he find Christ? Or would there be just a lot of those he called Christians? But back to John 8. In verse 27, they did not understand that he was telling them about his father. And so Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone. For I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you believe Jesus? Are you holding to his teaching? Do you know the truth this morning? Have you been set free? How is your behavior changed because of your belief? Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. Thank you for your word this morning, which is sharper than a double-edged sword, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to examine our lives. 
Lord, we do not want to be found, Lord, to have missed the mark. Lord, your word says that in this world we are to be like you, Lord Jesus. Make it so. Lord, we don't want those around us to look at us, Lord, and not see you. We want to be like you, Lord Jesus. Help us to, Lord, really examine our lives. Speak into our hearts, Lord, and convict us of those things that we need to bring before you in confession and repentance, Lord. Ultimately, Lord, this life is all about you. And we would just ask that you would have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, thank you for sharing this time together this morning. The announcements will run straight off to the service. There will be a slide there for God's tithes and your offerings. Please take notice next week there will be no WhatsApp service running. We will be running live on um, Facebook. So the WhatsApp service will come out much later in the day. Um, please join us at 10 o'clock uh, at Cornerstone or live at 10 o'clock on Facebook. As we close, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face radiate with joy because of you. And may he grant you his peace as you live in him and through him. Today, tomorrow, and so forever in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.